Just started my trek. I have way too much gear. Look at, the, look at this. Minus 28 right now. Going uphill with about 80 pounds of gear. I just started this hike and I'm already finding these wolf tracks. They're coming down the trail. It looks like they chased an elk or something. Look at that. It's a big dog. Tell you what, I'm very glad I brought my 12 gauge with me. It's worth packing the extra weight in my opinion. If I'm running into stuff like this already, who knows what's up at the top. So I was hiking up this hill and uh, I came across this pre-made lean-to shelter and that is a bingo if I do say so myself. Saves me a lot of work. I didn't get as far as I wanted to go to today just because I'm losing light fast and I don't want to get caught on the side of this mountain in the dark with no camp. So. Uh, Basically what I'm doing right now is gathering wood to make a fire. I want to get warm, I want to get all my gear thawed out and uh, hunker in for the night, see if we can maybe lure something in here, see what we can attract. There's wolf tracks all over the place. So I'm glad I have this shelter because it gives something, you know, puts something against my back. A little bit of protection if something tries to sneak up on me. But uh, yeah, right now I'm just getting my camp set up. It is still very cold, as you can tell. My beard is just icicles and uh, it's snowing a little bit. Very cold, apparently. Uh, what I was told before I came out here is that it could potentially get down to minus 40, minus 41, 42 tonight. So this fire is key. It's gonna be a long night though, that's for sure. Long, cold night. This is quite the contrast from being out in the city, I can tell you that. Like it's one thing to be making videos about Sasquatch in front of the computer and posting them uh, like every day, but you know, this is the real world. This is the world nobody thinks about when they're in the city. They just, everyone's all caught up in their lives and going to work and coming home from work and having dinner, going to bed and doing the same thing over again the next day and the next day and the next day. When you come out here to places like this to see, you know, what the world is actually made of, you really get a sense of what it could be like to, you know, have to survive in a place like this. Like if the Sasquatch exists, it has to survive out here and uh, it does it with no equipment. Like I have a bunch of gear. I can't imagine doing it with absolutely nothing. You really figure out what you're made of when you come out to places like this.
This wood's really brittle on these matches. I'm Rob McNeil and uh, I've been in the Sasquatch, you know, research for about 10 years. Um, my first interest in the subject, of course, started as a little kid. My grandpa had some old John Green books and, and uh, I remember, you know, looking through them in his basement and just kind of being uh, quite intrigued by the whole notion of it. And uh, that kind of continued into teenager years and stuff but never to the point where I thought I'm gonna go look for this thing it was more like you know say to my brother hey did you see the newest Sasquatch footage on the news or hey did you see the newest Loch Ness footage on the news we were always kind of into that kind of uh, stuff I guess the mystery right a mystery uh, really got me so that's how I first kind of got into it I guess I was kind of into it all my life but then I, I, uh, I don't know, one day I, I just started looking into it more and uh, I come across this organization in Western Canada, the Western Canadian Sasquatch Research Organization or WCSRO for short. And uh, I kind of made contact with a few of the guys from that organization and, and they uh, said, okay, sure, you can, you can join us. And, Unfortunately, there was some infighting as usual in that organization and uh, that kind of imploded and uh, myself and a good friend of mine, Roman, and uh, another friend, Sean, we decided to start our own uh, just Alberta, that was it, kind of organization where the Western Canadian, I mean, you were doing Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, Yukon, Northwest Territories. So. So we, we thought we'd just try an Alberta one and, and then we came up with albertasasquatch.com. Well, like I said, um, when I first got really involved and active in the actual search, I uh, was with the WCSRO and, and uh, the main guy I really became friends with, uh, Roman Forcheck, he, um, he had had an a incident happen to him at Ram River Falls, right at the campground there. And that was actually kind of a hot spot about 10, 15 years ago. There seemed to be a lot of reports coming in. So he asked me to go out with him. He'd had this encounter the previous summer. And uh, I said, sure, let, let's go. So um, we went out there and uh, we just happened to meet some other guys just from the WCSRO who just happened to be there, right? I mean, it was the hot spot, so. So people were going there. Um, so we, we got talking to them and we went and sat by their fire and, and uh, we were all sitting there. It was maybe 10 o'clock at night and, and we were just, you know, BSing and whatnot. And out of the canyon, we heard this, I don't want to say a howl, but it was like a scream, you know, this really loud scream. And, and you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in the bush, Roman had, these other guys had. And all of us went, what the hell was that? Like we, none of us could, could identify it right off the bat. So we were all sitting there kind of, ooh, what was that, you know? And then we sat there for about 20 minutes and, and Roman and myself said, well, we're gonna go back to our site and, and see what happens. So we left them at their site. They were, the funny thing was they were with like their families and stuff. They weren't even there researching, they were just there camping. And uh, so Roman and I went back to 
our site. And our site happened to be the very back ring um, of the campground, right up against the deep forest. And it was where he'd had his encounter. We, uh, we were sitting there and we just had a really low fire going. And um, Roman thought, well, I'm gonna go let a few wood knocks off. So he walked out into the bush, 50 yards maybe, you know, whack, 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 three times, come sat down. We're sitting there talking, nothing happens. Maybe another 20 minutes goes by half an hour. Well, let's try it again. So he goes out and he does this three or four times probably. And finally it's about two in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. There's not a soul around us. There's nobody in our ring. And there's like, there, there wasn't that many people in the campground overall. There was a few in the first ring where those other guys were, but not really much for people there. And he goes out does another one and it's like 2 30 in the morning whack 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 he comes walking and he just comes to sit down beside me and pretty deep into the deep forest we hear you know just a loud wood knock you know and uh and we thought i looked at him i mean the hair on my neck just went and, and i looked at him i said did you hear that and he, yeah i heard that so we listened and listened and that was reminiscent of his previous encounter that he'd had in that site. Um, so we waited another 20 minutes. Roman went out, knocked a few more times. Nothing else happened that night, you know. But just the, the fact that, I mean, this wasn't just a tree breaking or, or you know, it wasn't natural. It was, it was a wood on wood, real poppy wood knock, you know. And, and, and it was probably, might have even been upwards of a couple hundred yards away, you know. But it was it was from deep in the forest there like campgrounds behind us it come from that way right and uh he'd, he'd had a another experience too where the previous summer where him and his girlfriend at the time were in that same site and uh he said there was like nobody else in the campground except for one set of people him and his girlfriend were sitting there and uh, he was just kind of strumming guitar around the fire. He said same thing, he'd go out, do a wood knock or whatever, wait half an hour, come sit and talk, you know, nothing was happening. He said all of a sudden, he, he hears this wood knock and it comes from pretty far that way. And ooh, what was that, you know? So then they kind of quiet down and, and they wait and then about half an hour goes by and he goes out and he lets off a wood knock, comes back. And then all of a sudden he hears a wooden knock from that direction, only it's closer. Okay, so they, again, they're talking amongst themselves really quietly, low fire. I think he's put the guitar away by this time and uh, he's like, okay, let's try it again. And he said his girlfriend's getting pretty freaked out at this point, but he goes out again, third time, pop. But only, it kind of went, first one was there, Second one was there, third one here, and a lot closer. And he said, like, oh my gosh, you know? And they're getting freaked out a bit, you know, but uh, they wait, they wait, half an hour goes by, nothing. And they say, okay, that's it, let's go to bed. Well, they go to bed, they just zip up the tent, get in their sleeping bags, when he said all hell breaks loose, almost right beside the tent, just in the bush, and he's, he said it was comparable. He did an impression for me, and I instantly said to him, that sounded just like the Sierra sounds. And he said, yeah, I know, hey, like that's, that's what we heard. And he, he said, it continued for a while, then it stopped, and then all of a sudden, you know, an hour later, a rock gets thrown at the tent, like a pebble, but you know. And he said it was just all night long till about five in the morning, when all of a sudden you could hear this thing just walk away.
Well, I got my fire made, so staying warm won't be an issue or shouldn't be. Still got to go get more firewood though. I got to gather enough to last the night. <sighs> Don't want to freeze when it's minus 41. Check it out. Pretty sweet. I'm just trying to thaw out my gear and some of my snacks. They're getting really hard. And the tripod head that I brought is really, really like frozen. I can't even like tilt it or pan it. So I'm trying to thaw that out too. I have to make my bed, gather that firewood, and then I can settle in, maybe walk off, see if I can find any kind of evidence around here. Haven't heard anything yet. It's just dead quiet. So we'll see what happens. that that's gonna be good it's gonna be tasty I'm starving right now and this is just what I need a couple of steaks I was thinking like what is the Sasquatch diet are they omnivores like us or are they herbivores or meat eaters well I don't know most people think they like kill deer, they kill elk, but you know, when that food source isn't abundant, like I don't see why they wouldn't eat like vegetation and berries and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's most likely that the Sasquatch is an omnivore. It just makes the most sense. Um, unlike me right now, I'm going for the straight meat diet. And it is going to be fantastic. This is living right here. I don't know, I'm a pretty like picky eater. I like to stick to the basics. So I'm eating steak, it's not even seasoned, it's just plain. I do have a box of instant stuffing though that I'm going to whip up to go with it. It's going to be, it's going to be good. I should probably get that ready actually. I don't think these are going to take very long to cook. But I did put up some decorations in my camp, you know, some Tibetan prayer flags. A lot of people think Sasquatch is like a spiritual creature. And I thought, you know, what the heck, this might help. It kind of looks interesting and it makes it a bit more homey. I like the way they look. I'm not a religious person, but uh, I like that part of that culture, like the prayer flags and the, all the bells and, you know, I don't know. I think it looks cool. Just been spending the last little while gathering more firewood for the night. It's burning really quick, so it's kind of hard to keep up with it. Hopefully I can stockpile enough to last me through the night. I don't want the fire to go out at all. Basically the plan for tomorrow is to summit the mountain that I'm close to. I originally wanted to get a lot further today, but it just didn't happen. So I'll make my base camp here 
and uh, later tonight I'll kind of go off exploring see what I can find see if I can hear any sounds find some tracks maybe and who knows if I'm lucky enough maybe something will be curious enough to come by I'm just kind of going about my business not trying to you know stand out too much received a lot of flack on the last documentary for making whooping calls so you know to keep everyone happy I'll uh, avoid doing that who knows what the correct method is for you know luring in Sasquatch nobody knows for sure it's all hearsay whoops work whoops don't work whistles work whistles don't work you know everybody believes different things and there's different groups that believe different things but nobody knows for a fact what works the best because Sasquatch is not 100% proven to be a real creature but uh, gotta be really careful in this area because there's so much deadfall and trees just all over the place and it's all covered in a blanket of snow so it'd be really easy to really easy to uh, sprain an ankle and to hurt yourself and I'm the only one here right now I'm all alone and there's no one to help me so that would not be good at all It's pitch black out here. Like, I can't see a thing unless I turn my headlamp on. But it's super creepy. Super creepy out. And uh, it's just an odd feeling being out here right now. I don't know what is around me. I wish I was just back in the lean to at the fire but gotta explore see what I can find in the dark apparently you know they say Sasquatch is most likely a nocturnal being and that makes sense you know for a creature that's trying to remain hidden from people I'd be doing a lot of my moving around in the dark you know when humans are out and about and it's dark out we take shelter somewhere we don't like to be out at night it's just against our natural instincts we like to be somewhere where we feel safe whether that be by the lean-to at the fire or in a house or a cabin or whatever whatever it is you know and this is just this day and age almost feels unnatural being out in a place like this at night because you know we're so used to being in a town or being in a big city where it's just there's people everywhere even if things are going bad like say there's like I don't know a person trying to hurt other people or some sort of attack there's still good people around and uh, there's a community so out here when you're alone it's just you and your wits and your imagination and a 12 gauge because you never know what's gonna sneak up on you. Could be a mountain lion, could be a wolf, could be a rogue Sasquatch that wants to cuddle with you at night or, you know, eat you. I don't know. But uh, it's actually like almost really hard to see where I'm going right now because it's so dark. I can. Like the stars and the moon reflect off the snow a bit, and that's kind of what I'm going off of. I guess I'm just looking for tracks, but mostly, like, is it so quiet? Any sort of sounds, that'll be key. Any sort of strange sounds, whether it be like trees falling, branches breaking, you know, things of that nature, or even like vocalizations or whistles or things like that, you know. It's very, very common now to hear like whistles and apparently that's what they do is whistle at you or whistle to each other. I know like Ron Moorhead's Bigfoot vocalizations, whenever I think of those and I'm out in a place like this, it just creeps me the hell out because 
they are so unnatural sounding and just strange and bizarre. Never heard anything else like it. And uh, if I heard that out here right now, <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do. I might just freeze, I might run, who knows. Probably best to hold my ground if anything crazy happens. I had a report come in on my website and it was pretty it was pretty new. It was filed end of May and it was filed by an oil field worker who was driving north on the trunk road and about a kilometer before the Brown Creek campground, he said one went across the road in front of him. He he saw it, you know. It wasn't dark out. I think I think it was still light when he saw it. And this had happened, when that report got filed, it had happened about two, three weeks before. So I thought, we got to get out there. You know, that's probably the, the newest report to ever come in. You know, lots of times I get reports in there from 1976 or 1982 or, you know, this was by far the freshest report that came in. So we decided, okay, let's, let's go to Brown Creek and give it a try. It also read, uh, uh, a thing on the Alberta Outdoorsman Forum about, it was called, I think the thread was called Scary Night Near Nordegg. And it was about these two couples who stayed at the Brown Creek campground and had some high strangeness there, you know, like some unexplained uh, animals come through or whatever. So I thought, okay, let's, let's give Brown Creek a try. I had tried a lot, spent a lot of time south of Nordegg on the trunk road. I thought, let's try north. So we went to Brown Creek and uh, being as smart as I am, I forgot to look at the weather forecast. So we got there on the Friday and uh, settled in, got camp set up. It was myself and my brother and another fellow, another friend of mine. And um, we had a, it was really hot that day, probably, you know, almost 30. And uh, we were playing in the creek and fishing and just, you know, I mean, half of uh, Sasquatch research is just camping, right? and having fun and that's part of the reason I do it is just for the adventure you know and so the next day it started raining and I little did I know there was like a 50 millimeter rainfall warning in effect and I never checked the weather so it rained and it rained and it rained cats and dogs and uh, it went into the night and and so we luckily we had tarps and everything set up and and um, again if you know the Brown Creek campground, again, just one little circle, maybe nine campsites in it. You can see them all from your own campsite. I mean, there's nobody else there. Um, it's raining cats and dogs. And about 11 o'clock, my one friend said, I got to call it a night. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. So he went to bed, went into the tent, and myself and my brother were still sitting there. And uh, it was probably about 1230, and I was just about to say to my brother, I got to go to bed. I'm tired. But I hadn't quite said it yet. I was kind of humoring him. I think maybe he was, you know, having a beer or two or whatever, and we were just BSing. And uh, I had this little metal camp table beside me. And all of a sudden, I mean, the rain on the tarp was deafening. It was so loud. But all of a sudden, something, I'm not exactly sure what, I'm pretty sure it was a rock, come in under my tarp hit that metal table and went ping like that and then flew off and I think it hit the tent behind and I, I took me a second to realize what happened but in the meantime my brother jumps up and says was that a rock that just hit that table and I yeah I think so and he grabbed a spotlight and instantly spotlighted the direction we thought it come from but whatever it was it had to have come underneath our tarp, right? And our tarp was maybe five feet at its lowest point. So somehow this thing come under, hit the, hit the metal table and, and flew away. If it hadn't have hit that metal table, you would have never heard it. You know, a rock could have landed beside me and I'd never hear it between the noise on the tarp and stuff from the rain. So that one was really like a, what the heck was that, you know? So we thought, with this rain and the mud, there's got to be some sort of evidence. So we got geared up and went looking in the rain, trudging around. We couldn't find any footprints. We didn't see anything. But again, just another really strange 
how, how did that happen? What happened there, you know? Um, so we went to Brown Creek quite a few times after that. Um, I even met one of the uh, camp kind of janitor guys who comes around all the different camps and cleans them up and stuff. And I got talking to him and he was from up at Hinton. And uh, I said to him, this was the day after this happened. I said to him, yeah, we had something really strange happen last night. And he kind of gave me this look and, and I said, we had a rock come flying into our camp last night. And he said, oh, it doesn't surprise me. I said, why do you say that? And he said, well, he said, I come and clean this campground, you know, every couple days or whatever. And he said, many times I've been here by myself and you get that eerie feeling like you're not alone. And then he said, do you know how many times I've heard screams and all sorts of stuff come from across a creek up on the ridge there? He said, I've heard all sorts of stuff here that, you know, he said he was cleaning fire pits out he said, walking on this trail, all of a sudden, there's this track, you know, just fresh as can be. He said, no doubt about it, it was a, it was a Sasquatch print. He said, nobody faked that, nobody, you know. So this cast right here um, is a copy of Patty's trackway from the Patterson-Gimlin film of 1967. And this is one of the more famous tracks. This one was cast by Bob Titmus. Um, Bob Titmus came on the scene after Patterson and Gimlin. Patterson thought to take uh, cast, but he, he tried to get the best examples of the left and right foot. So this one was ignored because of this mark right here. Um, this mark is what later became known as what uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum calls the mid-tarsal break. And that's where he believes there's a, a joint in the foot for flexibility. This one is probably like a third or fourth generation of, of the Patterson-Gimlin uh, trackway. I think this is one of the, the better ones that Patterson had actually casted, uh, simply because there wasn't that mark. It was just flat. It was a, it was a good representation of uh, of the left or right foot, this one being obviously the left foot. Looks right, but when you put it in the ground, it'd be left. And this one, again, is another Patterson-Gimlin uh, trackway cast. This one um, was owned by the late Barry Blunt. He uh, was a researcher in BC, and I acquired this from his uh, wife after he passed away. And again, another, I think there's probably a second or third generation cast, but this one's in really good shape. But again, it, it was one of those ones that Patterson thought really represented uh, the right foot quite well. You know, that one you can see has been redone so many times, there's not much for definition where that one you still get some good toe definition. And, and I mean, this one's probably my favorite, just simply because of the mid-tarsal break and, and the variations too, you know. They measured out at 14, 15 inches, Patty's um, trackways. Obviously, some you get a little bit longer because maybe it slid in the mud or whatever, but uh, yeah. Well, heading further up the mountain, it's a lot warmer today actually than yesterday, a lot warmer. And there's a lot less snow the higher up I get. So I'll continue up, up this mountain and uh, see what we can find, see if we can find any tracks or anything, or hear any strange noises. It's kind of windy out today. The trees are swaying back and forth, creaking all over the place, so. to make sure I don't confuse myself with any other noises of the area, you know, any other natural sounds.
got my crampons on. It gives me lots of extra traction in the snow. Because I'm alone, I don't want to take any chances. I want to be a bit more sure-footed. Don't want to slip and uh, hurt myself in any way. Break an ankle, things of that nature. So crampons, good idea. Also got my mountain axe in case I have to arrest if I fall. Sort of track trackway going down the mountain here, but you can see behind me. Super hard to tell like what they are. They were probably from a much smaller animal, probably not Sasquatch. That peak, that's my destination. So I'm gonna head up there. It looks extremely windy and cold. You can see the snow blowing around up there. It's actually getting significantly colder out right now. And behind me you can see there's more, more clouds moving in. So I wanna to get to the top quickly. Like there's loose rocks and shale all over the place. If you're gonna break your ankle, this is where it's gonna be. Like right now where I'm walking, you can't really see what's underneath. I'm actually so tired right now. I can barely hold this camera out to film myself. Like my shoulder is so sore. I haven't even ate, <laughs> I haven't ate breakfast yet today. I didn't eat anything. Look at this. This is insane. I made it to the top. I was worried it was gonna be a false summit, but it was the actual summit. Take a look behind you. Just wilderness. Crazy. Basically what I'm kind of doing right now is just using my long zoom lens to scan the landscape ahead and just to try and make out any movement in the trees. Like I can't see anything with the naked eye from here, but this lens can zoom in very far so really handy for scouting things that are really far away. And uh, this little valley looks like the perfect habitat for Sasquatch. So. I can't stay up here too long, unfortunately. The sun is gonna go past the mountain really soon. 
and I don't want to get caught up here in the dark. So I'm just going to grab what shots I can, scan, scan the landscape and uh, see what I can find. There's reports in like the Nordegg area of the Sasquatch being like over 12 feet tall. Like back in the 50s and 60s, I think I read a report from back then and it was like, they said it was like 15 feet tall. That's insane. I think that's a little far-fetched, but because usually you hear reports about seven to eight feet tall, maybe nine. Seems to be the average, 15 feet. That's getting a little outrageous, I think. I think I better start thinking about getting down. Well, I guess it would probably be after we went to the Alberta habituation site or the Nordegg spot or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'd been told about that site by a friend of mine, Ken Walker, and, uh, and he said, you know, go check it out. So I went out there and, and uh, found the structures that were kind of, the site was famous for, I guess you could say, and they were interesting to say the least you know um and so then we really started devoting a lot of time there i think uh i think i've been this will be my fourth year out there now um and that's pretty much the only spot i go to anymore um we've had let's see we've had a two different accounts or incidences of wood knocks where we've heard wood knocks um we've heard weird whistles in the middle of the night um heard a scream never found a footprint something i'm dying to do because now of course i have alter cal and plaster of paris and everything else but haven't found any footprints out there um but the one night uh we were out there the one that sticks out the most for sure um it was end of September, it was snowing, um, and I was in my outfitter tent with my brother, and then my friend Dave and his fiance were in their outfitter tent beside us. And it was about three in the morning, probably, and my brother woke me up and he said, Rob, did you hear that? And 
I, I was in the middle of sleep and I know what, what he said, I heard a knock. Actually, I've heard a few knocks. And I said, Oh, well, okay. I kind of come to, and he said, just listen. So we were just sitting there listening, listening. And all of a sudden pop, there's a knock and it's across a Creek, but pretty close. And you can hear it. Like, I mean, my brother said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah. You know, so we listen, we listen. And about two minutes later, there's a knock, but now it's from completely different way behind us. He says, did you hear that? Yeah, of course I heard it. So now we're, you know, sitting there just listening, listening. So there's that knock, then that knock. Then a couple minutes later, another knock from that direction. And then a couple minutes later, another knock from that direction. So I heard four total knocks that night and my brother heard three and they were all pretty close to camp, middle of the night. I mean, this is no, nobody's out there. This is the middle of nowhere. You've been to that area, you know how remote it is, you know? Um, but again, can I prove that it was a Sasquatch? No, you know, but it, it was interesting. I mean, it got my hair on my neck up and, and so the next day it had been snowing. So the next day we, we went out and we started looking around and it got sunny that day and, and tried to find any footprints, anything like that, nothing. But as we're sitting there, we're like, okay, it's time to pack up. So we're packing up camp and we're just about done and we still have a fire going and, and my brother and, and my buddy Dave and, and Megan are, are by the fire and I'm kind of standing a little bit off and then all of a sudden clear as a bell again right across the creek kind of supposedly sat same area where dr meldrum had his sighting so we go across the creek have a look around don't find anything as usual you know but again i couldn't just explain it off as oh it was you know ice in the tree that was you know making a crack or anything i mean these are really Every wood knock I've heard out there has been really like a real pronounced poppy wood knock like that, you know, that kind of noise. Um, so there was that another time again, I don't know, maybe I I'll be there. Nothing will happen. I pack up and all of a sudden stuff starts to happen again, packed up another time. We we're there, my friend and myself and, uh, we go, I said, let's go pick up my trail cameras before we go. We'll go hike and go do that. So we go, we, we go to cross a creek and the creek is kind of, there's like a gully there where that creek is. And, and we just get down to jump over the creek when up above in that same area, once again, we just hear, it sounds like somebody pushed a tree over, just crash and holy cow, what was that? And we run up the side hill, look around, don't see anything, but it, I mean, it was just, so pronounced like you know like an actual tree falling in the forest kind of thing but we couldn't see anything that had been uprooted or or moved or anything um there's just been lots of little things like that just enough to keep your interest peaked to keep you coming back again like whistles in the middle of the night you know i know like there's owls and there's birds that will make noise in the middle of the night but it it always comes from that same area and, and you know you hear like at midnight, like, you know, it gets your attention. What is that? You know, maybe it is just a bird. Maybe, maybe it is some other animal, but enough to keep you interested, enough to keep you coming back for more, you know. This is actually the first time I've been up a mountain like this in the beginning of January, like not being on a ski hill or taking a chairlift up to the top. It's my first time hiking up to the, to the summit at this time of year, so. Couldn't have asked for better weather. Still no signs of anything at all. <laughs> this camera's got some pretty intense optical zoom and then you can punch in even further with the digital zoom it goes like over 2,000 millimeters.
I thought it'd be worth quickly stopping just to show you like, I wasn't on the peak for very long and already like my tracks coming up the mountain are like blown over with snow and they look totally different and they're almost like gone. They almost look like big Sasquatch prints. They almost look like big Sasquatch prints. Like look. They're totally different shape. Like they don't look like a boot. They look kind of like a Sasquatch print. But they're like, the wind has really changed them. Anyways, I can see how people can probably misidentify tracks that they find, just human tracks in the snow because they change so much in such little time. Well, it's night two. Today was a pretty tough day hiking up that mountain. My legs are done. I'm exhausted. No evidence so far. I haven't heard anything. It's just been quiet. It's been dead. That's better. Now you can see my face. Anyways. It seems like I'm going back empty-handed once again and uh, I don't know what I'm doing wrong either I'm doing everything wrong or it doesn't exist and I want it to exist you know all this time and effort put in I want it to be a real thing I don't want it to be some made-up legend I'll just have to keep coming out to these places keep hiking around keep exploring and maybe Maybe one day something will show itself. Or maybe I'll find something. You know, the one thing keeping me going is the tracks that I found in 2015 that are in the Wild Man documentary. That to me was just the weirdest thing. And I just, I can't explain it. Unless there's some naked person walking around in the woods, I don't know why there'd be tracks where we found those tracks like shoeless tracks, you see the toes. It's not a coincidence that that was in the spot we were in. Like, that's the one piece of evidence that I've found that I'm holding on to, to keep me going. Otherwise, if I, if I just kept, like if I didn't find anything on that trip, I probably would have just given up. You know, when you find weird naked footprints out in the woods where there shouldn't be other people, I think that means something. I tell you, it's just, it's one thing to be like out doing this with like a crew. Like when I was in Nordeg back in the summer of 2015, I had three other people with me. And uh, even just having one person with you, even just having one person with you uh, makes you feel so much more like confident and, and safe. Being out here alone is just like, something about it is so primal. And I don't know, I'm on, I'm on edge, not gonna lie, you know? I figure the best way to, to film a Sasquatch is with an incredibly long zoom lens, 4K resolution. Cause you know, if you're pointing your camera in an area where there's like no roads, where there's like no roads and buildings or anything. I mean, out here there's like, there's none of that, but. 
There's, it's just dense with trees and just untouched wilderness. And you see something like running or walking like up a slope by itself. And it looks like a Sasquatch. Like, what is it? It's probably an undiscovered primate. I don't know, if I just took my camera out here, like in the middle of nowhere, and I was up on the peak, and I pointed it at like a random clump of trees, and then all of a sudden something started running through the frame, up the hill, or something. That would be startling, because I would know, based on like the fact that, like there's no other people here, that it wouldn't be a human, it would be something else. And with like the higher resolution cameras nowadays, it's easier to pick out those details and to determine what something actually is. I think the discovery of Sasquatch would be the greatest discovery in the last like 100 years easily. Finding out that there's another creature on this earth that is just about human, like so close and intelligent, intelligent enough to make decisions and choices based on, you know, the environment that it's in and what's going on around it. It can say, oh, that's bad or that's good and make a choice based on that and want to consciously, you know, remain undetected. Basically, an, just an early human, almost. I don't think they're that far off. Like, we don't know exactly what the Sasquatch is. You know, is it Gigantopithecus? I don't know. Is it something completely different on its own line of evolution? I don't know. There's only one way to find out, and that's to, you know, see one up close and personal. Whether it be alive, somehow, or, you know, a deceased, a deceased Sasquatch, which I wouldn't want to, wouldn't want to shoot one. You know, I'm armed out here strictly for predator protection, like wolves, mountain lions. I also have like 12 gauge flares in case something happens and I need to send a signal out. I can shoot a flare up into the sky. People say Sasquatch can identify a weapon or a firearm. I like don't disagree, like maybe it can identify a weapon and be like, oh, that thing can kill me. But others also say that the Sasquatch can sense your intentions and your feelings and, you know, if you go in with good intentions, I think it's still okay to carry something for, for defense. I'm kind of addicted to that spot now after what's happened. And then there's the structures. Yeah, tell me more about the structures. Well, you know, okay, I guess this spot a little bit has to be explained. This spot is an old logging road off of, it's, it's a small branch off of a main road. Um, nobody, I don't think, really goes in there at all. It's a dead end road. There's a berm at the end. Um, and as you're driving down the road, if you're paying close enough attention, the first one you see is on the left and it's massive. Like you see it and you think, whoa, like that's, it's not just, a couple trees pushed against each other. These things are so intricate, like, you know, gigantic trees in a huge teepee style, but then you'll see a tree just completely hanging in the middle of it, balanced, no, not touching ground at all on either end, you know? And then you start trying to figure out, okay, if this tree fell on this one, okay, that might work. But then how did that one get woven in through there? You know, that kind of thing. Um, so the first time I saw that first structure was the first time I went out there and I was, I was blown away by it. I, I thought, what did this? Now, could man have made it? I don't think me and you could go out there and just throw these together and make a, make a structure, you know? Especially the suspended. I mean, that thing had to weigh two or 300 pounds at least and it's 10 feet in the air, you know? Um, but, Maybe, maybe when they were building the road, maybe the road building crew was just having fun, fun, but it's almost far enough and deep enough into the trees, you can't just write it off as that, you know? I've tried to think of other possible scenarios, what could have done this, but it, it's hard to fathom what could have made that structure. I don't think it's just natural 
trees falling in certain directions and they end up looking like a teepee. Not to say that that doesn't happen, but when you see the intricacies of these things, it's, it's hard to just explain it off, you know, snow loads and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, then there's another smaller structure to the right, right near the, the end of the road, which is where we always camp. Um, it's more like a standing tree with some that are kind of, it almost looks like a lean-to in a sense. That one, I think people could have made that one. Um, did they? Who knows? There's some odder, smaller ones that definitely people could have made. And with the number of researchers that have been in there, maybe people did make them. But they look like they've been there for a long time too. That's another thing. Like these structures look like they've been there for a decade or more, you know? And then probably the most famous structure that you see, you see it on the Les Stroud uh, episode and you've seen it on Todd Stanning's uh, documentary. It's another really intricate one. I wouldn't say the, the logs aren't quite as big as that first one, but again, you have this, this suspended log in the middle that like you could go play on the one end and it just, it stays there, you know? But some of these, some of these uh, logs, the actual, it's not like, okay, here's the base, here's the tip of the tree, and it went like that. These things are actually flipped around so that the tip of the tree is in the ground and the base is up into the structure, you know? How does that happen, you know? I, I again, it, it's really hard to explain it away. And that one's even further into the trees and a little bit more hidden. Like if you were driving by, you might not necessarily see that one. Um, and then quadding around the area and stuff, we found all sorts of possible structures. None quite as impressive as those two main structures, but all sorts of strange structures, all sorts of strange tree breaks. Like, um, again, I know tree breaks could easily be snow loads, could be a moose just trying to get up to the top of a, of a you know, small sapling and trying to get the, the green off the top or something and it folds it over and breaks it, you know? But a lot of them are like, you know, six, seven, eight feet and it looks like something's just went snap, you know? Um, all sorts of that. There is also, which I found really strange, but again, it's on the side of the road, so maybe it was, uh, maybe it was just placed like that, but there's two spots where you have upside down um, trees in the dirt, like roots are up top and it's upside down. Um, and if, you, if you've ever read uh, Robert Alley's book, um, Raincoast Sasquatch, about up in Alaska, about the upside down trees there, it's like that, but on a smaller scale, these aren't like, you know, huge trees, they're, you know, more like that. Um, but yeah, definitely like, they're eerie. There's something strange about them, you just, the hair on your neck just kind of goes up. So the majority of my research out there, you know, that I've been doing, a lot of it's just taking apples, taking bananas, you know, putting them on the structures and just, I guess, trying to gift them to whatever may be out there. And I used to always put cameras on the structures with the apples. And whenever I did that, nothing would happen. You'd never no apples would go missing, nothing would happen. I'd have them there for a weekend, nothing would happen. Have them there for extended stay when I'm there for a week, nothing would happen. The second I stopped putting cameras there, they disappeared. You know, whether it was apples, whether it was bananas, all of a sudden they're just gone, you know? Or you, you go back the next day, check it out, and let's say you put 10 apples there, well, there's only five left. There's none on the ground. There's none that's rolled away. You know, I know a lot of creatures could be responsible for that, but I found it really strange that whenever I had cameras, nothing would disappear, and as soon as I took the cameras off, something happened, you know? It's gotta be symbolism in a sense, I guess. Um, but maybe it's gotten to the point now with the number of researchers out there. I'm not the only one who's been putting apples on those structures. Todd Standing's been putting apples on those structures. I'm sure a few others have too. Um, maybe now it's got to the point where these things look at these things and think, oh, there's my next lunch or there's my next supper, you know? Maybe, maybe it has become a gifting area you now, you know? If, if that's possible, but um, 
you know, I can't, why would they do that? I guess maybe, maybe it's a marker. Maybe, it, maybe there, maybe I should get a shovel and start digging. Maybe, maybe that, maybe there's a body there. Maybe, you know, maybe that's how they mark a grave. There's so many ideas, right? Like it, it's hard to say, but they're, they're strange. They're eerie. They're weird. And a friend of mine, when we were there last, a little bit away from that, that second really heavily featured one that you see in everything, we thought, okay, let's, let's try and make a structure. Let's see what it takes to make a structure. So we tried making one and we did pretty good, you know, but again, it, you can't, some of those logs are just too big to move, you know? So our structure might look good, but it's a lot smaller, you know? Um, but we did some weird things like we found a really good stump that we were able to toss right into the middle up top, you know, it, where the next guy who comes along might be like, oh, how does that get there, you know? And we weren't trying to hoax anybody. We're not, we just wanted to know what does it take to make these structures, you know? And how you would suspend any of those trees in there, I don't know. I guess you'd have to be almost a master architect to do some of that, you know? Um, but yeah, def definitely, Definitely interesting, definitely worth checking out. You know, if you haven't seen them, I, I'd recommend checking them out, you know. I want answers. I want you guys to have answers. I want the world to have answers. That's the thing, if, if I film Sasquatch, if I get audio, if I find these tracks, you know, half the people aren't gonna believe it. it's true. That's the sad thing, like no matter how good the video is, it seems, it's still never good enough because it's so easy nowadays to manipulate video and there's so many different things you can do to a, a piece of footage whether it be like manipulating it with like CGI effects or you know having some sort of Bigfoot costume or suit and there's also the chance of like misidentifying something and that's just an honest mistake usually you know when you're jacked up on adrenaline and you're seeing something you don't know what's going on like, it's easy to, to misidentify things. You gotta remain level-headed, calm, usually very hard to do in those kinds of situations, but you have to be able to take a step back and analyze the situation and be like, okay, I'm playing it back in my head, this is what I saw, what are the possibilities? And just start, you know, going through the possibilities and uh, if the only reasonable explanation is an unknown primate, then so be it. It's been over three years since I started making Wild Man, my search for Sasquatch. Like, <laughs> this whole thing has been a journey. It's consumed a lot of my life, and you know, a lot of good things have come from it, and there's some negative things that have come from it, like, Obviously, like, there's family members and people that are really close to me that probably think it's the dumbest thing. And I try to explain it to them and get them to understand, but they just, they don't. That's fine, they don't have to understand, they don't have to get it, but it's nice when he, the people that are close to you accept, you know, the things that mean a lot to you and and this means a lot to me this quest there's more to the world than just going to work and making money and living those cookie cutter days day in day out doing the same thing like you need to come out here you need to come to these places and experience the raw world you know this is what it's all about what do you think the Sasquatch is for me if this if this uh, creature is real first of all I think it's flesh and blood I don't think it's a paranormal type entity I don't think there's a, you know I don't think it can switch dimensions I don't think anything like that right I think this is a flesh and blood creature I think it's probably a very rare creature um, but yeah I think it's flesh and blood and I think that uh, numbers are pretty low I mean 
And I think it's a creature that doesn't want to be found. I don't think it, it wants, you, you know, to be habituated. I don't think it wants that, you know. But I think it may be, if it's real, that it also might take an interest in people too. Maybe almost in a spying sort of way, like, you know, maybe when it is pitch black, maybe there is one 100 feet away just, just watching you. Maybe it wants to hear your music. Maybe it wants to see what you're eating. Maybe it wants to see what that pretty looking girl is, you know, something like that, right? Um, but but I, I do believe that they're a real creature that's, you know, flesh and blood. I, I, I can't, once you start trying to explain the mystery with another mystery, like a, maybe, maybe oh, a, it was an alien's pet that it dropped off, you know, or whatever, right? Like, a, you, you can't explain that mystery with another mystery. So I'm very of, much of the opinion that this is a flesh and blood creature, not supernatural, not anything like that. But you look at every uh, Native American group, you know, in North America, and Part of them think it's just a normal creature. The other half of them think it's, it's a paranormal type creature, you know? And I think that's probably one of the biggest pieces of evidence too, is why do, why does every Native American group in North America have a name for this? Why, why do they all know about it, you know? Obviously, I mean, they've been here a lot longer than we have. They, they know a lot more than, than we give them credit for, you know? It's a long slog out there. I mean, so when you go out there, you know, I'm looking at four and a half hours driving there one way, you know, um, but I've invested so much time into it that I just kind of feel like I need to go, keep going back. And I don't know, there's something about that place that just draws you, that just makes you want to keep going back. You know, if it was just, I've been to so many other places where you check it out and you know, you just don't think much of it. But I don't know if it's the structures and the ambiance of the place or what. It's just something about that place. Just, I can't help it. I want to go back. I, I'd go there every weekend if I could. I'd go there, you know, so much if I could. But don't always have the time. Real life gets in the way, you know. But yeah, I, I do love it out there. It's a, it's a beautiful area too. I mean, it, it's gorgeous. It's... Uh, there's a nice flats, nice valley, um, but if you want to go to the mountains, they're not that far away, you know, and, and you're in the foothills, I guess. And, and it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a neat place.